All right. Good morning, everybody. Good to have you all here this morning. If you're a guest of ours, we want to say welcome to you. We're thankful that you're with us today. Hopefully on the way in, everyone was able to grab the worship guide. That'll be helpful for you throughout the service. Uh, in the worship guide, there's a few tear outs. One of those is a prayer request tear out. Uh, fill in your prayer request. Note on there if you want the elders of the church only or the, uh, the whole church praying for you this week. And rip it out and you can drop it in one of the two boxes that we have by the doors. Also, if you feel led to give today, you can do it there or you can do it online. Another thing we have is a guest uh, information form. If you've never filled one of the, those out for us, please do that and drop it in those same boxes. And let us know uh, who you are and how we can be praying for you. I want to point out our library area over here. We have some Bibles and other books that are uh, free to you to help you along in your journey in following Jesus. So go over here after the service and pick up things, especially if you do not have a Bible. Please, please go over here after the service and grab a Bible. A few other announcements. We do have a guest information packet for you. If you're a guest and want to know a little bit more about our church and who we are and what we believe, that's out front for you. I do need to apologize. Mr. Ken, how are you? Good. I might have sent out a thing saying Ken had COVID. Uh, he does not. I, I noticed some of you were walking up this morning and you're like, uh, that's probably why. No, he's fine. There are others but that are down with uh, COVID. As you can see, we're, we're missing quite a few today. Uh, some are traveling. We have about seven or eight, a few deacons, I think uh, an elder up at uh, Steen Hatchie today, the church plant up there, trying to encourage them a little bit. So um, let's see, uh, other announcements for you. The ladies' luncheon went really well. They had 22 ladies and children, praise the Lord, at Steamers. I don't know if Steamers was excited about that, but they had a, a big time, a good time, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, youth camp went really well. Everyone has returned. Uh, we did not lose any children or chaperones, so that's a plus. Uh, they will give an update, not tonight, but next Sunday night. They'll give an update on the trip and how everything went, so uh, please attend that if you can. But tonight, we, at 6 o'clock, we will have our study time, and Leanna, will be, Leanna Dalton will be giving her update on her uh, mission trip that she led, and then also the camp that she worked at um, for the whole summer. So she'll be doing that tonight at 6 o'clock. Come join us for that. Um, biblical Counseling Level 2, the classes will begin September 15th, September 15th. Level 2 Biblical Counseling Classes. And they did want me to tell you, Lesson Deborah want me to tell you that if you have not completed Level 1, you can do Level 2, and then if you decide to continue on, you would just go back and do the classes from Level 1. So uh, anyone can come and attend um, starting September 15th. Let's see, let's see. I do want to note this. We do have uh, an overflow area. Uh, in the White House now, so if you go out these doors and over here into the living room, uh, there should be an overflow area with the TV up and you should be able to hear the, the sermon and other things. We have that, uh, of course not right now, you're looking around going, that doesn't seem very needed. Well, there are times the way our church fluctuates, but mostly uh, for those maybe sometimes we have some uh, people who have their children just getting a little noisy or they take them up uh, stairs to the nursery and after their, you know, five, ten minutes of crying up there, they just won't seem to stop. They're really struggling. Sometimes the parents go up there and there's kind of nowhere for you to go because you can't go in there with your kid because again, you're not working in there. We don't have a background check on you. That's not something that you can do. But we wanted to have a place for you to where you could go and help your child calm down. So uh, over here into the White House overflow areas where you can go, that should be set up for you uh, today. All right. I do think that that's all the announcements that I have for you. One other thing I will say is uh, Misty is back with us today. We're thankful to have her uh, visiting and her fiance, Sean. And so they want to invite, extend an invitation to everybody on August 16th. That's a Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, they will be uh, having a ceremony here, a marriage ceremony. And there's a pillar church that they are going to up there. And that one of those pastors is coming down to perform the service. And they want you guys all to come and celebrate with them on August 16th, 4 p.m. All right. All right, let me have those who are reading scripture, please come forward. Those who are reading scripture. Kevin will be reading out of the New Testament for us and praying for the service. Caleb's going to be reading out of the Old Testament. And so we're transitioning now to our worship service. So if you're able and willing, uh, please stand in the honor of God's word being read publicly. All right, I'll be reading out of Job uh, 13 through 20. Now there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the dogs were feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans fell upon them, took them, and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone... And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, 
there came another and said, The Chaldeans have formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I'll be reading out of Romans in the New Testament. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable is his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been the counselor? Or who has given the gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear gracious heavenly Father God, we, just, we thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for your, your grace and your mercy and your blessings upon us for those of us that are able to be here, Lord, and to praise you, Father. We ask you to just give us ears to hear, Father, and let our hearts enjoy this message that Pastor Bill is about to bring to us, Father, so we can further further just praise your name of your son and the great things he's done for us, Lord. Lord, we're so thankful for him, and we're so thankful for this, this church and this congregation and these members. Father God, we just ask you to continue to work through us, uh, apply this message to our hearts, and let us take it outside of this church and make it part of our family and our friends and our community, Lord, and just Allow us to praise in Jesus' name. Father God, we ask these things because we love you and trust you above all else. Our hope is in you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. We, we did have a good week at camp this week, week and I was just thinking this morning, well, the way I feel how tired I am and all the rest of the campers and my wife is tired, we learned something in the morning worship service to kind of get us up and going and wake us up. I was really tempted to do this morning. I think we'll wait until next Sunday night. You think? Oh, wow. Wow. Wait, we we can probably just wait until next Sunday night to teach you that. Uh, we don't get too rowdy this morning. But uh, <laughs> come next Sunday night and hear about what happened in camp. And the fun. We'll have a video and a lot of pictures. And you can ask questions also. Uh, and I want you to be asking, think about questions to ask our young kids out of the first six books, uh, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, and about the story of Jonah. That's what we study on today, Daniel and Jonah. So if you have questions, put them to the test next week. We would appreciate it. Uh, let's sing Majesty, worship His Majesty together this morning. Majesty, worship His Majesty.
from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his, his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. All right, let's sing together. Come thou fountain of every blessing. <laughs> said this is our time for praying together and lifting up uh, the needs of the church and other churches in the area uh, we have Grace Christian Church is one of the churches Cornerstone Church Riverside and First Baptist Church of Live Oak and Hope Community Church and Rome International Church um, also we need to pray for Anybody that might be traveling, we're happy to see um, Jeff back with his precious wife. And also, um, it's good to have um, 
Cindy here, that is an answer to prayer for sure. Um, I'd like to start with a passage of uh, scripture that I'd like to read for you. <clears throat> and it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. One of the other things we like to do is pray for any visitors, home church, and um, we also are praying for missionaries, and we're praying for Japan, and I happen to know two words in Japanese, Ohio Gazamazu. I'm told that, I'm not probably pronouncing it right, but that's um, uh, greetings of uh, Japan. But if there's anybody here that's visiting from um, another church and would like to share their church with us, um, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you. So what we'll do is we'll have a time of a silent prayer where you can pray for uh, missionaries throughout the world, unreached people groups, and some of those are on the screen, and also um, any needs in our own community and other members in our church that might have needs or are traveling. So let's go to the Lord in prayer first, and then I'll close in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together as a church family and unite our hearts in prayer. Father, I pray for missionaries throughout the world. I pray for their safety. I pray for their needs. And I pray for the power of your word to work through them and touching lives in those countries that they are. I pray for those that might be suffering for the name of Jesus in countries that um, are persecuting them. Father, I pray for those in our fellowship that are struggling with health issues. I pray that you would touch them and heal them according to your will and timing. Father, I pray for those that are also traveling. I pray for the community here in Cedar Key and for the opportunity that uh, our church family has to speak into different people's lives. I pray that you would use us in our own community to touch lives. Father, I pray for our own families, for our children, and especially those in our family that don't know you, that they would uh, have ears to hear your word and that they would be saved. I pray also this morning, Lord, for anyone here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that through the message that Brother Billy gives us today, that they would hear uh, your word and the truth of your word. Father, I thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your son, only son, to die on the cross for our sins. Father, I again pray for the service to come and for the singing and for the fellowship, and I ask your blessing on this time. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Stand with us as we continue singing.
figure out where to stop Psalm 145 as I began to read it to put it in as our scripture reading and I couldn't find an easy place you listen at this uh, psalm that David wrote <clears throat> as I read it aloud he says I will extol you my God and my king and bless your name forever and ever every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They will speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the flame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of men your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are fail, falling and rises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of, the, of those who fear him, he also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. And I ask you, is he worthy? He is worthy. Let's sing together. <clears throat>
Amen. You can be seated. Uh, if you're dropping off little ones, go ahead and go out these doors, around to the right, up the stairs. So three doors there. Uh, each door is kind of has markers for what age your little one should be. Go in that one, drop them off at those doors. invite you to take your copy of God's holy and Aaron inspired and living word and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12. If you do not have a Bible with you today, uh, there should be some pew Bibles near you and you can turn to around page 263 in the pew Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 12. Lord willing, we'll work through verses 15 through the end of the chapter, 15 through verse 31 today. The hope of the sermon, I'll give that away, obviously that God would be glorified, but that you would see that Jesus is a good and gracious king, that Jesus is a good and gracious king, that you would grow in that very belief and understanding. We had a guard when we lived in West Africa. It was pretty common for those who were Westerners or those who would be kind of more um, upper class to have guards. You have compounds that you live in. Yes, there are places out in the bush where there's uh, just a bunch of mud huts and things, but in cities there were some mud huts and there were some kind of uh, nicer houses, if you will. And generally you had a wall that went around your compound. And this was very, very normal. And so this is what was uh, rented for us by uh, the believers who were in Mali. And so when we arrived, we were shown our new house and our compound, and they introduced us to our guard. His name was Jom. Jom, last name, not John. Jom is his name. Last name, Sidibe. Sidibe, which that last name tells you which tribe he's a part of. And over the time there, I uh, spent a lot of time with John. I hoped to uh, see him come to know the Lord. He was a very devout Muslim. And he would come in the evenings before the sun would go down, and he would stay up all night and, and guard our compound. That was his, his job. And so we spent hours and hours talking about the Muslim faith and the Christian faith. And I would try to convince him of the truths of the scriptures. And he would try to convince me the truths of the Quran. And as you can tell, it didn't work. And still to this day, I, he has not professed faith in Christ. So as you think of him, please pray for him. Towards the end of our time, one day, John came and he asked me to borrow a little bit of money. Now that's not extremely rare. But it wasn't just a little bit of money. John came and he said I'd, that he would like to buy some property, he would like to buy a small house, and he'd like to buy some cows because his tribe, they were um, herdsmen. So he said, could you loan me roughly 25,000 U.S. dollars? Now he has asked for like a dollar to go get milk or something like that or bread, but 25 thousand U.S. dollars, you can imagine that I was a little shocked. As I thought back on that, obviously I was not able to give him that. But as I thought back, two things struck me. One, he thought that I had enough money that I could give him $25,000. That struck me. And he also thought that I was gracious enough to maybe give it to him. He thought that there's a chance that I would give it to him. 
And that made me encouraged. As I was working through 2 Samuel chapter 12, 15 through 31, that story came to me as a reminder. Because I think we see something similar in the text today. Follow along with me, as I'll read in just a moment, the text for today. Let me set context for you before I do it. Last week we spent time in the first part of chapter 12, where Nathan rebuked David. See, for those who haven't been with us, I'll start at 2 Samuel chapter 7. God made a covenant with David and said that he would bless David and that, that on the throne there would always be one from David's family. And in particular, there would be one that's coming that would reign and rule forever and ever. And that would be Jesus, as we were singing just a few moments ago in the song that comes out of the book of Revelation, the, the root of David, connected to David, that's Jesus. So God makes a, a covenant and a promise to David, and we saw in chapters 8, 9, and 10 that the kingdom of Israel was at its highest point. God was absolutely blessing David, blessing the kingdom, and David was reigning as a king should. The only thing that he was really doing wrong is he, as we've said before, he liked the ladies. And he kept taking more and more women, more and more wives. That led us to chapter 11 where David did the terrible thing of murdering one of his friends, one of his close friends, and stealing his wife. And we talked about the great sin that David committed, and in chapter 12, God sent Nathan to rebuke him. And if you remember from last week, Nathan started off and he told him a story, a a, a story about a shepherd, or about sheep, if you will, and a rich man and a poor man, and how the rich man took advantage of the poor man and killed his only lamb. And David got so angry about it, that he said that that man in that story should die. And then Nathan revealed that David was the man in the story by taking Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. We notice that David, in his response to being rebuked by Nathan, he repented. It was a simple two words in Hebrew, but he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then we spent time in Psalm 51 reading David's prayer around that time. And our time ended with looking at David's true repentance and that Nathan the prophet went to his house, and that's how we ended. And so that leads us to what happens next. 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 15. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. And he became sick. And David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold... While the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How can we say to him, the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows? whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. 
Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet, so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rabbah and the Ammonites and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then, gather the rest of the people together in a camp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. Verse 30, and he took the crown of their king from his head. The weight of it was a talent of gold, and in it was a precious stone. It was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount, and he brought out the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes and made them toil at the brick kilns. And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of his word. He was warned that the son or the child would die. The one that he had with Bathsheba, the one that caused him to not be able to cover up the fact that he had committed adultery, the one that led him to murder his friend, that child was going to die. That's what Nathan had told him earlier in chapter 12. And so this section kicks off, as we see in verse 15, that the Lord afflicted that very child. The Lord did it. He said he would do it. We talked about how this was discipline or judgment from God to David. The Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. If you've ever had a very, very sick child that's close to death, it is a scary, scary place to be. Everything feels out of control. You can't do anything. And then we sometimes say, we can't do anything except pray. We really need to change our thinking on that. The greatest thing you can do is pray. Because the Lord is sovereign. So the child is sick. He was told by the prophet that this was going to happen. And instead, what's interesting, is instead of being like, well, that's what's going to happen. Look what he does. Look at the text. David, verse 16, therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. The prophet said the child's going to die. The child gets sick. And David says, I think I'll pray and fast. That doesn't seem to be the thing that we would expect him to do. Because God already said this is what was going to happen. It's like David knows something else about God. It's like David knows God is a gracious God. Have you ever seen in the Old Testament before where the Lord had judgment coming on people? And those would intercede on their behalf and the Lord would, as the text would say, change his mind. Now we know that the Lord is sovereign over all things and even the actions that are happening there are part of his plan but jesus is pretty clear you have not because you what ask not friends let me just encourage you from the beginning here don't miss things because you don't ask the lord whatever it is don't miss things because you don't ask the lord no 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 david knows that god is a god of grace and so even though the prophet has come and said The baby's going to die and the baby is now sick. He's going to go to the Lord and he's going to go and pray. He's also going to fast. And so I take just a little side note. We're going to have two little little steps away, if you will, from the text for just a moment. Twice this is going to happen, hopefully, during the sermon, where I just want to give you an idea about a couple things that are brought up. One is fasting. Fasting. I would ask you to raise your hands, but um, some people get uncomfortable with that. 
But I would ask, are you in the discipline of fasting? It's very common in the scriptures. And in fact, Jesus expects you to do it. When he's explaining fasting, he says, when you fast. Should be something that we're doing. It's, it's, it's part of the means of grace that God gives us. It's a spiritual discipline that we can do. It goes along with prayer, and it puts us in the path of God's grace to receive more of God's grace. To grow, to look more like Christ. You have to do the things that God has said, that this is how you grow in grace. You be in His Word, and you be in prayer, and you be with His people. And part of that is fasting. Let me share a few things with you about fasting. Just some highlights here. There are different types of fasting. There's kind of a normal fast where you abstain from, from food, but you still drink water. You can see some of these throughout the scriptures. I'm just going to list them today. There's a, a partial fast where people will just limit uh, their diet in some ways. This isn't just to lose weight. These are spiritual things that you're trying to do. But we see that in Daniel, for example limiting your diet in some ways. There's an absolute fast where you avoid all food and liquid, even water. There's even sap, uh, supernatural fasts that are happen like with Moses and we're talking 40 days nuts without anything. And then I'll throw in here as well the idea of fasting from idols or things that have your heart. This could be things like television or your phone, social media, maybe something else in your life that you need to step away from because it has control over you. Different aspects of fasting. They're done in private. Nobody else knows because that's between you and God. You're not doing it so everyone else can pay attention. There's times for a private fast. There's also, we see in Acts and in Joel, where the congregation, God's people, will fast together about things. In 2 Chronicles, there's even a, a, a national fast for the nation of Israel. That works better if you're a theocracy, which means that God is the ruler of your nation, then the nation can respond. What's the, the point of fasting or the purpose? Well, it's to strengthen prayer. It's to help you seek God's guidance. It can be part of ways of expressing grief. It can be to seek deliverance or protection. It can be to express repentance and return to God. To express grief. Minister to the needs of others. Pray for the work of God. And worship Him. Those would be different reasons that you would go and fast. So just a side note there, if you're not that familiar with fasting... Let me encourage you that if you're a member of ours, I would encourage you to go and talk to Doug and Miss Barbara Maple and ask them about fasting if you want to know more. I think they could point you to more truths about it. So we go back in our text in Samuel. David, in verse 16, he sought the Lord on behalf of the child and he fasted and he went in and he lay all night on the ground. So you can think now. He's not eating any food. At least to that. And he's seeking the Lord. There's repentance that we've seen and he's seeking on behalf of the child. And here's what's interesting is the elders of the house, they're beside him and they're trying to say, get up off the ground. Others tell him, no, 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 don't do that right now. He wouldn't do it. He's devoted. He's focused on crying out to the Lord. Even when others are trying to pull him up from doing it, maybe you should find people who will go and fast with you. Maybe they're thinking, God's already spoken on the matter. And David's saying back, yeah, but I don't know if it's his last word on the matter yet. I want to go to him because he's a God of grace. But then the answer comes. Verse 18. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was alive, yet alive we spoke to him, and he would not listen to us. What are we going to say now? I mean, we're afraid he's going to kill himself if he finds out that the baby died. And 
But David looks across the room and he sees that the servants are whispering together and he knows at that point the, the child's dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, yes, the child is dead. What David does next is, is stunning. For those of you who've lost children, perhaps a miscarriage, it's hard to, to do what David does next. Verse 20, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. Did you hear it when we also read the Job passage? When we were reading through the Job passage and Job had lost family and all this stuff. And he went and he worshipped the Lord. The only way, the only way that you can go and worship the Lord when this type of catastrophe happens is you understand that God is sovereign, that God is good, and that you can trust Him. The way you know that, of course, is by the very grace of God that He reveals that to you. But if you're not in that place, you can't go. You can't truly worship Him like David's able to go and worship Him. Because here's what David's saying. When you go to worship after that, here's what you're saying. Lord, your decision is right. Your decision is right. Even though I've prayed and I've fasted that you would save this child, your decision is right. It's hard when we have various trials and we go to the Lord and we ask that He would deliver us from them, deliver others from them, and He chooses not to. To respond like David or in the first part of Job like Job, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You have to have a completely different perspective on things. You have to realize that you are not sovereign. You have to realize that you don't know everything. And you have to be humble and trust that he does. David goes and he worships. Notice he worships first, and then look what the text says. He then went to his own house, and when he asked, they got food for him and he ate. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't, he doesn't go and get a bite to eat first. He goes and worships. He needs to be spiritually fed first before physically fed. The idea of our daily bread. Your daily bread is Christ himself. That's why he calls himself the manna from heaven, the true bread. Now this confused the servants. They're like, wait a second. <laughs> Baby's alive. You're fasting, you're praying, baby dies, now you're worshiping and eating. Help us. What? 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 It says, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be, what's the word? Gracious to me, that the child may live. That who knows phrasing, those who've been studying the prophets with us, that comes up over and over again. Like in Nineveh, when Jonah goes to preach against that evil nation. And everyone is repenting and fasting. Even the animals, they make them wear the sackcloth. And they said, we deserve it, but who knows, maybe the Lord would be gracious to us. David said that the, the child was here, there was a chance so I prayed and I fasted. But now that the child is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Second little side note, little excursion we're going to go on, is the death of children. Let me say right up front that this text is not trying to answer that question. You really shouldn't try to, to take this text and answer that question of what happens when babies die. Here's the truth. 
the Bible isn't extremely clear. It's not extremely clear. I do think there's some passages like this one that you can consider, or Jesus' attitude towards children. Let the children, what? Come to me. We had a, a miscarriage when we were in Turkey. And I wondered, God, is, is that child with you? He did not give me an audible answer. Here's where I had to leave it. Lord, you're sovereign. Lord, you're good. And you're the one who decides. And so I can live out my days trusting you. Trusting you. Do I think the child is with him? I think so. I can't know for certain, but I do know what I can. I do know. God is sovereign. God is good. And I can trust him. And friend, you can do the same. You can do the same. Look what happens next. David's been under the discipline of the Lord. He's prayed and his child has died. You could wonder, David doesn't seem to, you could wonder, has the, has the Lord forgiven me for the sin before that I committed? This baby dying because of David's sin. That comes up in John chapter 9 as well. There's a man who's blind. And the people ask him, is this man blind because of his sin or because of his parents' sin? Evidently, that's a thing. Our sin brings terrible things to our lives and if you understand things biblically, to the lives of others. Your sin never only affects you, it affects others. And there is an idea of the sins of parents or grandparents and the effect that it has, the consequences. They're the ones guilty but the consequences. You're the one who's guilty for your own sin, but the consequences go further. And they ask Jesus, they go, what about this guy? Why is he blind? His sin? Parents' sin? Which one? Jesus is like, I'm going to take option C. This guy? He's blind for the glory of God. Excuse me? I don't know. I think I might feel better if it's his sin or his parents' sin. Jesus says, it's so that God would be glorified in and through him. See, there's, there's things that are evil in this world. Sin has brought in death, pain, suffering. There are aspects where what is going on is a result of living in a fallen world. There are aspects of it is someone's sin, consequences of their sin, or your own. But make no mistake, whatever is happening, God is working the good of those who love him and for his glory. He wastes nothing. He wastes nothing. And he even is so powerful and so wise, he uses your sin for his glory. It is remarkable. And so David is working through all of this. Baby dies. Verse 24 says, Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son. And he called his name Solomon, which is linked to the word peace. David, there's peace. You've repented, I've forgiven, there's peace. It doesn't mean the consequences aren't still there, but there's peace. And in case you doubted that, look what it says, and the Lord loved him. And sent a message by Nathan. Here comes Nathan again. This one, he might, he, he might be happy about delivering this message. Nathan the prophet. And so he called his name Jedediah. Which is beloved by the Lord, of the Lord, because of the Lord. Do you know that's where that name Jedediah comes from? Some of you heard it. I love that the Lord affirms his love for David and his promises to David in giving him another son. And the Lord just loves Solomon. It doesn't even say, it's not because Solomon, Solomon did anything good. The Lord just loves him. 
And then the narrative switches, and it ends with the battle again. 26 tells us that Joab, his general, is still fighting. Remember that this whole thing kicked off. This, this, this war was going on. They had gone to take over this place. Joab had left to go fight the Ammonites and take over this place. All before Bathsheba and all this happened. And Joab went, and we remember that David was supposed to be there as well, and he wasn't. And all this, this stuff happens, and the, the war is still going on. And now that we see David repent, and we see the child die, and we see him worship, and now we're going to see David being where he's supposed to be, where he should have been before. Look, Joab sends messengers to him in verse 27. Hey, I fought against Rabbah, I've taken the city of waters. Now then, gather the rest of the people. Come and take the city, lest I take it and they call it by my name. You better get over here. We're about to win. So what does David do? He gathers all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And look at this. Becoming, he's the king of Israel. Now you're having the king of all, even these other nations. They took a crown of their king and put on his head the weight of a tent, which is somewhere 65, 75 pounds neck would be a little sore has a precious stone and placed it on david's head he brought out the spoil of the city a very great amount and he brought out the people and they set them to labor he doesn't kill them he sets them to labor and he does this against all the ammonites and then david and all the people return to jerusalem david's back where he's supposed to be he's worshiping the lord rightly he's out at battle instead of committing sin that's what true repentance looks like Let me share with you eight areas that I see God's grace in this text. Eight areas I see God's grace in this text. And just before. I see God's grace, as we talked about last week, in the rebuke that comes from Nathan. God loves us and he will not allow us to continue in sin. So you see God's grace in the rebuke. Likewise, you see God's grace in the discipline that comes upon him. The discipline that comes on David. You see God's grace there. You see God's grace even in the answer. When David cries out, you see God's grace in the answer. It doesn't seem to be gracious that the child would die, but it is. Well, how? I don't know. But I know that God's a God of grace. And I do know this, that that child didn't have to face the turmoil and the nightmare that comes for David and his family coming forward. There's grace in the answer. There's grace in the hope for the future. Do you notice there where David says, I can't bring the child back to me, but I'm going to go and be with the child. Seems to be this personal thing. He's like, I'm going to get to see that child again. Going to be with I would argue, God and the child. So there's grace in the hope of the future. There's grace in the worship. Even when it's a terrible thing, God's grace is with him in his worship. Number six, there's grace in the restoration that we see with Solomon being born. There's grace in the restoration. There's grace in God's election. You see that in God choosing not only David, but in choosing Solomon. There's God's grace in election. And last, there's God's grace in God's grace in him keeping his word. He could have judged David, but he promised. He promised to bless David. Not because David's great, but because God is great and at the end of this scene David is sitting with a crown on his head God keeps his word and there's grace there so let me encourage you to take away these three things realize that God is a God of grace and ask him for things even if it seems impossible can I encourage you Ask him. 
Even if you think, there's no way, I've done way too much, there's no way he would bless me that way. Let me encourage you, say, God, is this your last word on the Kind of like our kids will sometimes do. No, we're not going to do that. And one will come up. Is there any chance we could, we could still do that? Is that your last word on the matter? Sometimes I say, yeah, okay. Your first takeaway, ask the God of grace. Second, worship the God of grace. No matter the response, no matter what's going on, trust Him. See that He's sovereign, see that He's good, and worship the God of grace. And then lastly, trust the God of grace. Trust the God of grace. Ask the God of grace, worship the God of grace, and trust the God of grace. If you start to doubt God's grace, you don't need to look to Solomon's birth, David's son. If you doubt God's grace, look to David's true son. Look to Jesus. He's the example of God's grace to you. His life, his death, his resurrection is the promise that your God is a God of grace. Some of you were raised by very mean fathers. And some of you have a hard time seeing God as a God of grace. Let me encourage you, look to Jesus. You will see that he is a God of grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to see you rightly as a God of grace. Help us to see grace when you rebuke or discipline, Lord. Help us to find grace in the the future, the hope that we have. Help us to see your grace even when the answers are no or are hard or, Lord, we don't understand them. Help us to trust you. Help us to be a people who ask Because you are way more gracious than we could even think or imagine. And we know that you'll give us abundantly more than what we ask. Because you are so gracious to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to see if Mr. Uh, Mike would come forward. Uh, Mr. Kevin, if you'd come up. And uh, Brother Doug uh, is going to come up, and we're going to prepare the Lord's Supper for you here. And even when we take the Lord's Supper, it's just a reminder, a proclamation of the grace of God and the shedding of Jesus' blood and the, uh, the breaking of his body for us. So we're going to take a few moments here and uh, get this prepared for you. And while we're doing that, you guys go ahead and, and pray and ask the Lord to search your heart. And if there's anything you need to repent of, let me encourage you to do that. If there's somebody here that you're having friction with, some, some issues, then I would encourage you to uh, get up now and walk over to them and say, hey, uh, we don't need to settle it all right now, but uh, please forgive me or, or forgive them, extend forgiveness if you need to, uh, before taking the Lord's Supper, okay? So take a few moments now while we prepare things up here for you. First Corinthians chapter 11 about the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. All right, so we're going to uh, start in the wings and then work our way back to Matthew. And uh, if you're a, a follower of Jesus uh, and you're in good standing in your church, even if you're not a member of this church, you are welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us. We would invite you to do so. Uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus at this point, then just observe this. This isn't for you. This is something for you to observe. And while everyone's waiting their turn, I feel free to read Scripture to encourage the congregation during this time. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and start here. here. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to respond with uh, give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Tonight, 6 o'clock, come and listen to Leanna talk about uh, the trip to Guyana and uh, the other ministry she's been doing all summer. Uh, if you feel led to give or you have your guest information forms or your prayer requests, drop those in the boxes again before you leave. Check out the library area. And uh, Brother Doug has a blessing, I believe, for us before we go today. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. 
May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. Have a blessed day, everybody.